Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andris Sprutz, and I am director of the Latvian Institute of International Affairs, and I am also a professor at Riga Stradinch University. And today I have the great pleasure and honor to uh, introduce and also to moderate the discussion on the results uh, of the NATO summit. And uh, also I'm very pleased and honored uh, to have a discussion in a, such a very wide audience, very well represented, very well attended, also with a distinguished uh, speakers uh, at the table and also with very distinguished speakers as, as uh, speakers for introductory remarks. So I think the, already the beginning is, seems that there is a huge interest uh, uh, on results, what we've seen, uh, on implications, what we've seen uh, during the NATO summit in Wales. Some would say that it has been a historic, historic summit. Um, that uh, we have seen some transformation from uh, Churchill's, Reagan's, um, Helmut Kohl's NATO to Merkel's and Obama's NATO. Let's see what it means. Let's see how history will tell us uh, whether it has been a historic summit, what we've seen. Has been really a transformation of NATO in the last days, or some convergence of, of interests and positions also might see divergence of interests and positions later on. So I think it's time to tell us. So very important what will follow as well. It's not just about summit itself. At the same time, I think, uh, and we agree here many in the Baltic countries, that it has been very historic for the Baltic countries. That I would even call it as a summit of mutual commitments. Commitments from both sides. Commitments from the, our NATO allies that uh, the Baltic countries are absolutely full-fledged members of NATO alliance. And this, I think in this regard, has been important. I even repeat myself that, look, in 2014, we finally joined NATO, what we've been joining, we expected to join, or we believed to join back in 2004. Ten years later, finally, there are contingency planning. There is also now a readiness action planning. There are potentially the forces. So there is perceptions that we are full-fledged members of like-minded security community. And I think in this regard, these signals are very important for the Baltic countries. At the same time, commitments from the Baltic countries that uh, we cannot be free riders, that uh, solidarity is uh, both so. Uh, it's two-way street. It's two to tango. So if we want to see and expect solidarity from the side of our allies, we need to fulfill our commitments as well. And a 2% defense is a very important element in this regard. And, of course, Estonia has done its homework. I think we still also see that there are a need to pr proceed uh, in this regard here in Latvia and Lithuania as well. So it has been very important. Uh, we should uh, remember that uh, largely the... The silver lining for us, uh, we've we seen the positive signals from NATO summit also largely uh, come from quite unhappy, quite dramatic events in, uh, in the eastern neighborhood, also in Ukraine. Uh, the NATO, there is shared opinion, of course, it has been a Russian aggression. That, of course, the NATO uh, crisis, uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian crisis, of course, uh, in Ukraine or in the region, of course, we still, uh, we still not see the result of this. We still not see the end of, of all of this. So the bloodshed continues, unfortunately. That's why um, we have to discuss not just what it is for us, for the Baltic countries, but how historic, how important it has been also for our partners uh, in the region, how we can establish and continue a partnership with Georgia, with Ukraine. We have been calling also Russia for a long time as a partner country, so how we can continue our relations with Russia. We would like to have a partnership relations with Russia. We still refer to the NATO-Russia Founding Act as an act which is functioning. So that's why uh, today we have, I think, a very very excellent uh, panel of distinguished speakers. As I said at the table, we have also the very distinguished guests to give the introductory remarks. All this event has been possible thanks to, to, to the help of an assistance of NATO, so we are very happy to have a NATO representative. And uh, we've always been actively working with our partners abroad, but with two institutions uh, here in Latvia, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense, so we are happy to have representatives from those two institutions. And and uh, two representatives, of course, is Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, 
Edgar Svinkevich, State Secretary of Ministry of Defense, Janis Sarts, and with this uh, I am giving the floor for opening remarks to the Minister, Mr. Rinkevich. Minister, the floor is yours. As this is going to be quite a long introduction or opening remarks, and both in the European Union and in NATO we are used to sit for long hours, uh, I'll just use the opportunity to address you from the panel and also to associate myself with the panel as well a little bit. But uh, as Andris has already said, many when they are talking about uh, NATO summit in Wales have considered and have talked about this summit as a historic summit probably the significance of the summit uh, is very, very, <coughs> uh, let's say, large if you look at uh, recent decades. At least for Latvia, I would certainly say that two summits have been really very important. One was Prague summit in 2002, when Latvia, along with six other so-called Vinus 10 group members have been invited to join the alliance, have been invited to join the alliance in a bit different circumstances than we have witnessed developing right now. And second uh, summit is Wells Summit, when in a situation where there is a challenge to the existing international order, to existing uh, order in the European continent, we have also seen decisions taken actually to revive NATO course mission, to revive uh, commitment to Article 5, but not only in political, but also in a very practical sense. Uh, if we look at uh, the overall discussion and results of the summit, let me just outline a couple of points. Uh, what uh, I would certainly consider as very important. Well, first of all, I think that since March, and I already said that, we have seen a challenge, a revision of the whole existing international order since the end of Second World War. Uh, even if we have had collapse of the Soviet Union and collapse of Yugoslavia, very peaceful, uh, let's say partition of Czechoslovakia in two countries, the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic, those processes have happened within no country, as far as we can tell, uh, since 1945 has attempted to annex the territory or the part of territory of the other country. I think that this is a fundamental change and fundamental challenge in the continent. The second, of course, we have witnessed also an absolutely new, uh, let's say, type of warfare. At some point in NATO, we have referred to it as a hybrid warfare. Um, I even don't know, fourth, fifth, sixth generation warfare depends how you, uh, how you define uh, probably previous types of warfare. But certainly we have seen that uh, in 21st century, uh, there is a combination of classical use of force with so-called green man, cyber attacks, information warfare, uh, and we have also witnessed uh, unprecedented, uh, let's say, use of uh, propaganda as part of, of this information warfare, even to some extent, and I still remember uh, 1980s, uh, and when Soviet type propaganda, I would say that what we have seen currently has probably overpassed uh, all uh, examples I have witnessed as a, as a teenager. In this respect, I think that uh, the decisions that NATO summit has taken, a readiness action plan, also a commitment to develop a proper 21st century response to 
those challenges from Latvia's point of view is adequate. There have been a lot of talking about stationing permanent bases, but when we were discussing what we do mean by the term base, and we could get the answer from, well, you already have one, uh, like in other with American troops, and actually every NATO member's base, uh, our armed forces base is also a NATO base. And ending with something like uh, Ramstein Air Base in Germany, which is actually American base in Germany, not so much NATO base, and huge number of troops that should be stationed in every Baltic country as well as in Poland and Romania. I think that uh, if we look from our point of view, our major interest was to have such a NATO response that would be adequate to current situation that would include some certain elements and I think that all those elements are there. I will not steal talking points from my colleague in the Ministry of Defense. He will be able to talk in more detailed way, but I think that uh, a joint expeditionary force that is going to be created, prepositioning of some military equipment, uh, improvements in infrastructure, command control elements, as well as uh, permanent, actually permanent exercises, as long as it is necessary uh, of NATO allied forces in the Baltics, in Poland, as well as uh, in Romania and in the Black Sea region is something that I would certainly call as adequate. Having said that, we have also said that we reserve right and nothing stops at 12th. Actually, it's only beginning. Uh, if situation deteriorates in Ukraine, in the region as a whole, if we see the further development also and deployment of Russian armed forces in the vicinity of our borders, a surge of troops and so on, then of course we reserve the right to come back to NATO and to discuss additional measures that would improve also our security. Uh, on the other hand, it is also worth to remember that NATO has been successful through its deterrence mission, not through the actual test of, of the commitment. So I do hope that those measures uh, or measures that can be taken in the future will be sufficient to deter whatever intention uh, is there in the neighborhood. Uh, another issue which I want to outline is that I think that we have given proper attention to the challenges of 21st century. There is a broad agreement, consensus, that Article 5 covers not only conventional warfare but also hybrid warfare. I think that this has been very important. I think that what we have also seen is that there is a growing understanding that cyber defense let's say defense in the field of information is equally important. And here, of course, I'm very pleased that NATO summit also reaffirmed the commitment of the Alliance to develop strategic communications, uh, the Center of Excellence for Strategic Communications of NATO here in Riga. This process is well underway under the leadership of our defense ministry. We do hope also that there will be more allies who will send their experts, uh, who will send also um, their, let's say, experiences. And already when the Baltic presidents met President Obama in Tallinn, actually issues that are related to strategic communications, to cyber defense, uh, also to reassurance package to the Baltic states were very high on agenda. So I'm very happy that this understanding is, uh, let's say, there in, in the alliance as well as in its member states. Uh, also, I would outline that we have been particularly happy to see that there is going to be special relationship with those partner nations of NATO that have contributed a lot in NATO operations, be it Afghanistan or Kosovo. 
Of course, if we talk about our region, I'm referring here to Sweden and Finland. Uh, I don't know whether there is Swedish or, or Finnish ambassadors in the audience. I see the Danish ambassador, so he will certainly pass the word uh, to, 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 to his colleagues. Uh, I will not be referring to jokes that usually the Baltic politicians are making on their Finnish and Swedish counterparts that we still hope to see them in the alliance whenever they want and we are ready to assist them to do that. But I think that from the practical point of view, the package we have agreed uh, actually brings them um, very close, actually de facto, uh, uh, members of alliance, not of course de jure and not politically. And I think this is very important also for the security of the broader Baltic region. Another issue that always Ministry of Defense likes to outline and Ministry of Finance really hates, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs usually tries to mediate and, and to set a kind of trade-offs between those two extreme positions is, of course, defense spending. Defense spending, 2% of GDP commitment, is clearly set by all allies. I think that uh, this is important that we understand that uh, we cannot only demand defense, demand, uh, let's say, that somebody comes to help us, but also we contribute sufficiently to our own security and to our own uh, defense. Uh, most probably, I've already had kind of working breakfast with Minister of Finance, and I warned him that most probably uh, we will have to reconsider some of our planning for defense spending uh, already when it comes to the discussions about uh, about next uh, <coughs> budget cycle. <coughs> so it's another kind of, you know, consequence of uh, being in, in the summit. Don't think that I've lost my voice shouting at any one in the summit. It was just a kind of um, uh, small, small flying consequence. Uh, but also, we should understand that uh, in the 21st century, it's not only about tanks and, and guns and, and all other military equipment. Actually, uh, there has been a lot of talkings that also police force, border guards, uh, let's say ministries of interior uh, should be also put as a part of the overall contingency planning, because we all understand that if we look at current situation in Crimea, in the eastern Ukraine, also those uh, agencies play quite a role. So speaking about 2% for defense, speaking about improvement of capabilities, I would also say that in the 21st century also ministries of interior, police force, border guards, intelligence and counterintelligence uh, play an equal role. And I'll talk about another challenge later, but if you look, for instance, information that we have received that a couple of uh, Latvian citizens are fighting in eastern Ukraine in, uh, let's say, as a part of uh, so-called Donetsk and Luhansk uh, People's Republic, we also see that many Europeans are currently fighting in Syria, in Iraq, as a part of ISIS. So this is actually a new developing phenomenon, and we have to develop also proper responses to this challenge as well. It's not only about putting fences, putting uh, military equipment, but it's also addressing broader issues. Uh, I would certainly say that uh, I am happy to see how uh, the general thinking uh, in all levels, starting from heads of state and government, including responsible ministers and experts, are changing about, is changing about the situation in Ukraine, in Crimea, how we perceive uh, attempts to revise the whole international system. Of course, we still have uh, differences of opinion, but if you have 28 members of the alliance or 28 EU members, it's only natural that we come to the 
decision-making process as a compromise. At the same time, I want to say that uh, there has been some discussion, and this has been principal position also of Latvia. And if we talk about further development of NATO-Russia relations, I would certainly say that we want to keep uh, channels of communication open. Having said that, you know that NATO has frozen almost all cooperation with the Russian Federation. We do want to continue dialogue on issues that are related to security. But we also do not want to see NATO-Russia founding act as something equal to the Washington Treaty. We certainly think that this is only one mechanism that lets us keep some channels of communication open to discuss issues if we see them fit, but we certainly do not see um, that uh, anything in this uh, founding act can be of, let's say, equal or even higher uh, importance than Washington Treaty. From that point of view, we consider that current decisions taken by NATO are of purely defensive character. We have already seen, uh, seen since NATO-Georgia war in 2008 that there has been military buildup along our borders, along Baltic and Russian borders. We have helicopter base in Ostrova full of attack helicopters. Look at Kaliningrad, where there is uh, actually uh, quite a military build-up and modernization ongoing. So from that point of view, we consider that current uh, steps taken by the alliance are of, of defensive nature, and we do hope that also um, this will be seen also in the same way in our neighborhood as well. Uh, also, let me just say a couple of words about some other issues one, Ukraine. I think we have had very interesting discussion at the level of heads of state and government in Wales with Ukrainian president. It actually happened in, uh, in the same time when in Minsk they were negotiating a uh, ceasefire agreement. I think we all understand that Ukraine currently is in a very, very a challenging situation. Although there have been some calls that NATO should provide weapons and military equipment to Ukraine, this issue actually was not discussed at length because NATO does not provide as an, as a, as a, as a alliance uh, such kind of equipment. However, I do think that there is going to be some moves by individual member states who have capability to do that, but I also want to say that I was pleased to see that there have been quite a lot of commitments and pledges to four NATO-Ukraine trust funds uh, in different, in different uh, fields, command control, logistics, training. And NATO is ready to provide as much assistance as it can through those mechanisms. Uh, also, Latvia has contributed to one of those trust funds related to command and control, and I think that our defense ministry really stands ready also to continue uh, cooperation with Ukrainian defense ministry. Uh, yes, probably it is uh, quite, uh, quite sad that we see situation in Ukraine deteriorating and there are not many instruments we can use, apart, of course, from political dialogue, economic sanctions. But I also see that uh, uh, further action uh, that we were discussing and that usually was referred in the press was simply impossible because NATO member states are not ready to go there. On open door policy, I think that uh, this is a bit the disappointment part. We have always supported our good friends, Georgians, since I believe 2006, since Riga summit, uh, in, in their attempt to get membership action plan. However, uh, the good story is that uh, substantive 
substantive package we have agreed actually in practical terms goes beyond what normal map country gets. Having said that, I think that we also have to acknowledge political signif significance of, of such things as maps and, and, and instruments we have developed, and that we certainly want to continue uh, along with other like-minded NATO nations to support Georgia for membership action plan and to continue to develop our uh, relations. As it was put in discussions at the level of foreign ministers, uh, Georgia has made quite an important step towards membership through its actions, and we certainly acknowledge the contribution in Afghanistan, the reform process that Georgia, along with other aspirant nations, have made. We have also discussed progress in other countries. Unfortunately, we do not see sufficient uh, reforms being conducted in other three countries, so it was not enlargement summit as we hoped back in Chicago. Uh, the good thing is, of course, that we have reaffirmed three principles that are also very, very important for us, that NATO enlargement is merits-based, that it has to contribute to the alliance's security, and that there is no veto from the third countries. I do hope that, uh, that uh, sticking to those principles, in 2016, in next summit in Poland, we will see already some more encouraging signs to aspirant nations. I've already talked about another issue that has been discussed at length, how we are tackling present challenges also in Syria, Iraq, or ISIS issue. And I think that here certainly there are no decisions at the level of NATO, but NATO summit was also witnessing the birth of coalition of the willing, the countries that are ready to, to use their air power to to strike uh, ISIS in Iraq, and I think that we all should understand, even when we see Ukraine, the threat that ISIS poses also to all of us is equally important. And here certainly we do want uh, the NATO uh, allies to succeed, and if we can assist, uh, we are ready to assist in any way uh, we can. The Afghanistan issue was, of course, high on agenda, and here I do hope that the political process will settle down. We will have president, and we will have two important agreements, one between the United States and Afghanistan on security issues, second, NATO Afghanistan so far signed. Latvia is committed to continue post-2014, to continue with uh, financial contribution to national security forces of Afghanistan, also to consider sending instructors, but certainly as an incoming EU presidency who understands that we will have to address uh, also issues that are related with Afghanistan, we want to see those uh, problems to be solved as soon as possible. We also want to see more NATO engagement with uh, neighboring countries of Afghanistan because we all understand that the challenge is not disappearing, it's simply transforming. Uh, finally, and I understand those have been quite long remarks, but I will leave you soon and I will let you criticize everything I have said, but not being present so that I don't respond and I leave with my own kind of uh, point of view. Uh, I think it was also a good idea to have a meeting between NATO and international organizations that are operating in both in Europe and in a wider context. I mean here European Union, OSC and Council of Europe. We had a special meeting at the level of foreign ministers. We discussed what can be done to improve overall cooperation between NATO and those organizations, what could be division of labor, and for us as incoming EU presidency, which is also 
by the way, going to be um, the presidency where next EU summit in May is going to consider uh, EU's defense matters uh, and also the progress EU is making in building its own capability since summit in December 2013, it was very, very valuable meeting. So uh, nothing stops at Wells. It's only beginning of the new road. And I do hope that uh, many of those very good decisions and intentions are going to materialize. But I think that most important thing that we have got out of summit is that there has been a unanimous commitment and very strong political signals that uh, NATO understands the current challenges and is ready to work to tackle them. Having said that, of course, now the hardest part starts. It's about who is going to pay and how we are going to implement those things. So I do hope that also uh, in two years' time, in our next summit in Poland, we will have most of those decisions implemented. And I still do hope that probably through those steps as well as through political process, things still can calm down and situation in Europe can uh, get a couple of degrees lower temperature as it is now. On the other hand, we also all understand that uh, there has been some fundamental shifts and uh, there is not going to be any more the world as we knew it in September 2013. With that, I think that NATO has got its kind of new, old new mission and probably all those who were thinking that why we should have NATO now have forgotten this question. Now the issue is how we can get the alliance as agile and as effective as we can. Thank you. Thank you to the thank you to the minister for uh, extensive and uh, comprehensive uh, remarks. Uh, I think it sets a very good tone, very good platform already for further discussions uh, here at the table and already some of the points on Russia, on uh, enlargement policy, open door policy, on different institutions being able to contribute and to be involved already were mentioned and I think as I said it sets an excellent, excellent platform uh, already for further discussions. But uh, I am still happy to give the floor uh, to, to Yannis Sartz, uh, Secretary of State from Ministry of Defense. I am not so sure if you have a chance to, to say much more, but uh, certainly, as Minister said, some defense issues, some security issues, certainly would be happy also to hear the perspective of Ministry of Defense. Please. Well, uh, thank you so much, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, four thoughts. First being that Three years being a foreign minister undoes 12 years of training for short speech in Ministry of Defense. Uh, uh, the, uh, the second thought, though, a bit more serious, is uh, I agree that uh, uh, Wales Summit has been a very successful summit, but most importantly, once again showed the strengths of NATO. Not in the numbers, not in the military strengths, but the strengths of adaptability, able to adapt to whatever comes next. Some in the Baltics might say uh, it was slow in coming, one might agree, but this adaptability is supported and the new solutions are supported by all 28, which makes alliance even more stronger. So what do we get? Uh, Minister already outlined some of that. From a military perspective, I would say we're very satisfied. In, in, in a shadow of Ukrainian war, we have strengthened from NATO our cap capability to react fast. We have troops, we will have troops, and we'll have bigger troops in Latvia.
from NATO allies. We'll have command and control elements, headquarters here in Latvia. We'll have infrastructure. We'll have equipment, including enablers here in, uh, on Latvian soil. We'll have big exercises, exercises aimed at tra uh, training Article 5 situations. And we'll have enhanced planning. So I think all in all, we got what we wanted. If we look at the new elements of the hybrid uh, warfare, we have uh, excellent Center for Strategic Communications, which was, uh, let's say, inaugurated, we might say, at summit. So we're doing our work also in this area. Um, so I think there are a lot of testimony that there's been a good work done. But my second thought is there's more to be done. And first and foremost for Europe, and already as Minister said on defense spending, we're spending 0.9% of GDP here in Latvia, and we're not the lowest spenders. So we have to really understand that it is important to spend adequately, not only uh, to social welfare, but also to defense, which is bread and butter to any state that wants to endure over the decades and centuries. And we are tending to forget that. So that's an important thing. Another thing that I think is uh, an area where we have to improve is an early warning. Not that much as technically, but actually uh, analytically, or being able to translate what are the signals we see to conclusions what is going to happen. And I think we so far have uh, failed collectively to do that, and we have to improve. Third, a fourth and last uh, thought, what about those that are in the Eastern Partnership, to say? I have to say, frankly speaking, uh, I think it's a difficult situation right now. They're in between two policies of NATO open door, through which it's difficult to get through, and very clear NATO's Russian door, closed, uh, Russian closed door policy, which says that nobody is going to leave their sphere of influence. So in this situation, and of course Russia showing their willingness to, to use uh, force to make the point about closed door, it is a difficult situation. But I think a lot depends on how uh, we will resolve the Ukrainian crisis. It will depend on how NATO's reaction and further steps will be and of course, much depends on the countries themselves and in the, in, on their internal processes that are very important to make the NATO doors open. With that, these four thoughts, thank you very much, and I hope to hear very interesting comments from the panel. Thank you. Thank you to State Secretary for the concise uh, Complementarity, a complementary speech to the minister's uh, speech, so I think it adds, adds some points and uh, already points of some discussion. So uh, I'm changing mics and joining the table as well. So first of all, Okay, so uh, we can already continue our discussion, and as I said, uh, as I said before, uh, the minister and state secretary set the tone um, in a wider context of what NATO is facing, what kind of challenges NATO faces, at the same time also what are the Latvia's position and challenges and windows of opportunities in the near future and how we can assess uh, the NATO summit uh, uh, what occurred just a few days ago. But as I heard from uh, both, uh, from Minister and also from State Secretaries, that actually for Eastern partners, or you might even make it wider for all the Eastern neighborhood, the situation is difficult. The, some results have been disappointed, disappointing. Uh, so I think these are some of the issues already put on the table and already setting the tone uh, how we can proceed with, with our discussion today. 
And uh, we have an uh, excellent uh, panel of very distinguished speakers, and I will not introduce in a detail at the moment. I will do it just in a due course so that we start discussion already. And uh, just to say that we have representative from NATO, we have representative from the Eastern neighborhood, Georgia, Ukraine. And we are very happy also to have uh, uh, Sergei as a Russian representative. I think it's very important to engage and to discuss how also Russia sees the situation. We have also the Western colleagues. Uh, well, I even find it difficult to identify uh, America, Finland, OSCE, but I think there are different backgrounds in the past, and I think it's also interesting to see those different, different perspectives from multilateral and bilateral uh, perspectives. Uh, with this, uh, I am... Uh, I almost was uh, happy to give a floor to Guna, but uh, before that I would strongly encourage uh, my distinguished guests, uh, distinguished speakers, to have up to se seven minutes uh, remarks, not longer, because Minister has taken his time, and uh, well, we have uh, some time until three o'clock, but uh, since uh, the time is really more limited, I stop here, and I also would kindly ask you to have up to seven minutes maximum so that we can engage uh, the, the all of our audience also for a sort of more incisive discussion. Uh, and with, the, with that, I'm finishing my introductory remarks, and please, Gunnar Schnure, who is a program officer at NATO Public Diplomacy Division, uh, what are the NATO uh, perspective, what has happened at NATO? So uh, what are your, the first, you can say, impressions and also the, how you evaluate, assess uh, what is going on with regard to the, our Eastern, Eastern partners? Please, Gunnar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the Latvian Institute of International Affairs. And first, let me stress that we at uh, NATO headquarters and in particular at the Public Diplomacy Division are very pleased to have such an outstanding partner here in Latvia as your institute, and we truly believe that the events and discussions you're organizing here in Latvia, they, they bring great value to the uh, public uh, discussion in, in Baltics and the region in general. Um, I'll try to be short, shorter than 70 minutes. Um, first, let me stress that from our point of view, it has been a very intensive summit. Unlike the previous ones, we have seen new formats, new meetings in new formats, which basically show the flexibility and adaptability of, of our alliance. Um, Minister already mentioned the number of them with uh, international organizations, but there were also some uh, meetings with uh, aspirant countries, of course, uh, operational partners, uh, of ISAF and, and, and uh, other partners as well. Um, I would like to group some decisions in, in four distinct groups. First of all, the strong political signals which uh, heads of state and government of the alliance have uh, sent. Um, signals in response to current security situation, and, and I would like to stress that these were uh, done not only in the context of what's uh, on minds of people here, of course, in Baltics, namely east uh, of, of the alliance and Ukraine, but also what happens to the southeast and, and also uh, northern Africa, because uh, among 28 of allies, you can imagine that there are a number of priorities, and, and not all of them see the uh, security and defense challenges emanating. Uh, from, from the same uh, region in the same uh, level of intensity. So the readiness action plan as a response number one to this was already mentioned. Um, it was mentioned that NATO decided to uh, go ahead with a spearhead force as part of the NATO response force. So basically uh, active and continuous presence in East of the alliance and a force which is ready to deploy within very short notice, so we're talking about a couple of days, if not hours, uh, with the necessary force, so be it land, air, naval, or special forces. And of course, the decisions on, on, on creation of local support elements, which were already mentioned by both of the previous speakers, uh, took place, which is, uh, as we all understand, very important for this part of uh, alliance. 
So next set of uh, decisions are the ones we could group around the capability development, and these decisions built upon already decisions taken at Chicago Summit. So uh, the defense uh, capability package, and, and here we're talking about uh, connected forces initiative, concrete decisions on, on, on boosting the training uh, and exercise schedule, so much more intense, uh, much more frequent uh, training also in this part of the alliance. Uh, smart defense projects uh, and very important uh, decision on defense capacity building initiative which is open to NATO's partners and here we uh, know that this initiative has already been uh, assigned for, for, for three of the partners, namely Georgia, Moldova and Jordan. But as the NATO summit declaration states, uh, NATO is ready for requests from, uh, from other uh, partners like Libya or, or Iraq, and, and we know that last year already we had the request uh, from the Libyan government to help in uh, defense capacity building. But now, um, due to the political situation in Libya, this decision has been uh, halted. Um, and, and this uh, initiative, defense capacity building initiative, is basically open to other uh, partners, but also non-partners, which is uh, very important. Uh, the Minister and State Secretary already mentioned uh, d decisions regarding capability development in er areas uh, regarding cyber defense, and uh, there are a number of, of, of others. Um, in short, the idea of the Defense Capacity Building Initiative is to project security and stability without large deployments. So use the existing knowledge and expertise of, of, of uh, NATO experts to help um, our partners to, 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 to uh, make their countries much more secure place. Um, next set of questions, I, I uh, heard from the minister that um, the open door uh, decisions have been Disappointment to some from the alliance uh, perspective, we've seen basically two countries advancing. I wouldn't say one, I would say two. Um, Georgia, as the minister said, has received a special package on, on how, on practical measures, how NATO will work together with uh, Georgian authorities on, on the areas which are still to be uh, developed in the, in the course of uh, Georgia's uh, way to NATO. Um, but I would also like to stress that um, Montenegro uh, received a very strong signal. Uh, NATO has decided to open intensified talks with Montenegro and there is even a, a very specific deadline set, meaning end of 2015 is the deadline when the NATO ministers of foreign affairs are supposed to take a decision if to invite Montenegro to uh, join the alliance. On the two remaining aspirant countries, uh, we can, we can uh, agree with the minister that the progress has not been that um, that, that big and, and the language there reflects it. Um, on, on, on partners and partnerships, um, as already said, very strong political support to Ukraine and also practical uh, support. And, and I would like to stress that this practical support is based on the requests, specific requests from uh, the side of Ukrainian authorities. Um, NATO has uh, also adopted a joint political declaration with, with Ukraine with a very clear language on how both sides see their future uh, cooperation. Um, and finally, the fourth set of decisions, I would call them long-standing commitments, um, or the uh, mentioned commitment to Afghanistan, which is, of course, uh, very much uh, pending on, on political uh, situation and developments in Afghanistan, but from NATO's uh, 
point of view from, from the alliance, the commitment is still there and, and nothing has changed. And also, if you would go through the summit declaration, you would see a long list of commitments and support for the work of other international organizations, and, and, and this uh, should also be taken into account. Overall, uh, significant summit, the last one for the current Secretary General. We were introduced to the new Secretary General, so one would say new era for the, uh, for the alliance to be seen. Also, an announcement of the uh, new summit location namely Warsaw, which is also a symbolic uh, decision to, to demonstrate uh, the commitment of the alliance to the eastern part of the uh, uh, organization. So overall, very important meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar, for, first of all, kind words about our cooperation. I really can confirm it that the NATO is also an excellent partner for us, uh, also for comprehensive, uh, comprehensive views. I wanted to ask you about Georgia and Ukraine, but I think that we will have also the Georgian and Ukrainian participants. But you, um, you made me curious about the uh, next Secretary General. Um, because Jens Stoltenberg, and as we hear that uh, Vladimir Putin calls him a friend Jens, uh, what does that mean? With the change of Secretary General, there might be also some changes in the uh, way of leadership of NATO, or you would say it's really, it really doesn't matter and that actually this whatever previous connections, connections as a politicians in whatever capacity, of course, Jens Stoltenberg is the Prime Minister of Norway, that it has influence or it doesn't influence actually what's going on right now. So what about the leadership styles? Would the change was, was change of the Secretary General? Of course, the, the leadership uh, strongly and heavily influences the the alliance is such if we compare uh, the existing, uh, the current uh, Secretary General with the uh, policy path uh, his predecessors have taken, it, it, it has a very clear um, characteristics of what this uh, leader has uh, wanted to achieve in his term. There are more active people and there are less active people. Then again, uh, we have to remember that NATO is consensus-built alliance, and the Secretary General is in the hands of 28. So whatever might have happened before and however um, um, the new incoming Secretary General might have been called by the, by the Russian President, what really matters is the opinion and decision of 28. Okay. Thank you, Guna. Uh, and next speaker is Eka. Keshalashvili, I think this time I did it right. I always had a small challenge uh, with 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 Ekas the name, but uh, hopefully it's right. So, President of Georgian Institute for Strategic Studies. So, Eka, we are always happy to have you at the table, and uh, we expect also uh, sort of what is your impression of NATO summit? Uh, on the one hand, difficult situation. Uh, disappointing results. On the other hand, you might say there have been quite strong signals politically, practically, diplomatically. Actually, here I am not so sure if I'm on a, this more disappointing uh, proponent side, but I remember that we also spoke of very strong signals in 2008. Mm -hmm. And then it just a uh, few months later it came to the Russian-Georgian war. So how you interpret what's mm -hmm the NATO summit now, and have those been really the strong and practical signals also to Georgia, please. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here and then having, obviously, Georgia part of that conversation, and very timely conversation, obviously, right after the summit. I'll try to be concise myself as well, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the main takeaways, basically, the way we view that in Georgia. And obviously, that's my personal view shared by some of my colleagues and friends, but it's, it perhaps might not be fully official view of Georgian government in that sense, but then I'd rather think that it's, it's, it's largely, largely might correspond to what the government could be thinking in that direction as well. 
First of all, I think when we speak about what could be the Georgian perspective about the results of this summit, uh, we have to start about the summit itself because we put everything that relates to Georgia into the larger context of what the summit was all about, basically, and then what were the major decisions that the alliance have undertaken because that's part of the larger picture and larger mosaic. Obviously, nothing is taken out from the context. So the major positive outcomes that have been spoken about about the summit um, are obviously shared as the positive results in, in Georgia as well, because what it brings uh, to those who aspire to be uh, part of the alliance and those who are not in front of the challenge of possible Russian aggression, but then who are victims already of undergoing Russian aggression, and in the case of Georgia, that's a continuous occupation of 20% of our territory, is reassuring in a way to see that NATO, uh, NATO has a bit of a comeback to the core of its function. With these last decisions that this summit have, uh, has undertaken, you see that it's a defense alliance, basically, because if you compare that with uh, Chicago summit decisions. And again, uh, I, I might be a bit critical on that, but then if you compare, it's a, it's a dramatic change, basically. And then obviously it's due with the dramatic changes that we see what happens in the heart of Europe with the aggressive war of Russia against Ukraine. But then, but then again, uh, Georgian war has never become a wake-up call of that type. So in, in the Chicago summit, we, we have these <coughs> phrases, uh, security challenges, but austerity problems, financial challenges, how to be smart about what we can spend about the defense. So there was this a bit of a, you know, again, shaken understanding how much actually hardcore security is key for peace, prosperity, stability for the alliance, and then for the partners of the alliance as well. And this is very firmly stated by now. So you see that if there is no security alliance sees and the members of the alliance that one cannot have a realistic expectation how one can ensure peace, stability, prosperity for the nations, so that if you want to have that, it's not how much money you have, but then how much wisely you spend on defense, but sufficiently as well. And then if you look at how precise is, are the directives of how much and on what actually in proportion it needs to be spent, it's very reassuring. It looks like a real action plan rather than political statement to me in that sense. Sense, sense of urgency, framework for implementation, and then actual, uh, not the timeline, but an almost close to that on how those should be implemented. But having said that, obviously, then uh, there is this mixed picture how we see what are the results for the country like Georgia, because it's a very specific country. It's a small country. It's a neighbor of Russia, 20 percent of it occupied. Uh, it's decided that we will be a member, but then nobody knows when and how. But then we are obviously persistent in terms of moving further and closer uh, to the eventual membership. So for us, open-door policy of NATO obviously matters a lot. And then it's not just simple words, obviously, or strategic aspirations, but something very meaningful and practical in that sense. It's reassuring that the open-door policy is stated all the time in all the decisions at that level of the alliance. And uh, we see in that summit as well obvious reassurance that the NATO open door policy remains to be there. And there is full commitment that European nations who fulfill the criteria and have the capacity of co contributing to the common security have the possibility to be members uh, being assessed on individual uh, merits without no other nation having a veto power. But then if you look into the uh, structure or semantics or the prioritization, obviously a hierarchy of what is placed where is not necessarily formally meaningful perhaps to that, but then in Chicago we've had, for starting from 10th paragraph, the open door policy and subsequent sort of paragraphs on aspirant countries and then what were decisions taken on that. An open door policy is now starting from paragraph 92, if I'm not mistaken. It's even below to the women and security issue, frankly. So uh, that shows a bit of how much NATO perhaps sees right now of whether or not it has capacity or appetite politically to look uh, deeper uh, to the enlargement potential as actually an integral part of ensuring common security. So uh, while I, not, I don't view that as extreme, in an extremely pessimistic view, uh, obviously one could have hoped that the strategic meaning in a larger context of what enlargement could mean for the common security exactly now when uh, the policy of Russia is so 
transparent and open what it is all about, one could have hoped that it could have had a, a higher priority perhaps in the decision-making priorities of the alliance. With respect to Georgia, there are two aspects in the way we look on what has been decided. One is the military uh, component of it, and then one is the political component of it. On the military side of it, we're extremely happy. Actually, we have the first time uh, a, a clear package. Obviously, we have to put together with the alliance the real meeting to that. Uh, declared uh, uh, package of cooperation, but then it's the real defense capability related military cooperation that we are about to start with NATO. And it's the defense capabilities in terms of the enhancement of that, it's the military trainings that will be conducted in Georgia as we're promised, and then the special training center that will be created in Georgia. So that's a different footprint and presence of NATO in Georgia in the defense field and extremely encouraging to us. We have to, uh, we have to obviously take um, note of it in a way that we make full e exploration of that potential. And in that regard, our expectation obviously is that it's not stated there as a strategic goal, but an actual action plan that will be implemented as soon as possible because Georgia's defense capabilities need to be uh, upgraded as soon as possible rather than being envisaged as a strategic goal by the alliance. I'm really trying to be very quick, but I might need two minutes rather than one. <laughs> so the uh, political angle, uh, political angle of, um, of the message there. Uh, we are still in this ambiguous um, uh, stage somehow with the alliance where uh, the membership of Georgia is not only decided at Bucharest but then has been reaffirmed at every other subsequent NATO summits but then we are always left in a position when it's unclear what are actual instruments for us to become the members. On MAP with regard to Georgia, alliance is very shy about it. Uh, there are talks how much MAP could be uh, or should be um, a necessary tool for Georgia framework to become a member eventually because Georgia is very far ahead in terms of compatibility standards and then in terms of actual interoperability of the forces as well if you look from that point of view. But then we always have these ambiguous phrases about that and there's no clarity from the side of the alliance in which circle we are. It's the MAP circle actually that will be necessary for Georgia or without MAP Georgia is moving to that. And then the last decision is very interesting in that sense. One can build on that in a good direction of maybe not being in a position to have MAP as a necessary one because it states that Georgia has all the necessary tools that are moving Georgia forward to eventual membership. I'd rather take that as an interpretation that MAP is not necessary, but I'm not speaking on behalf of Alliance, and nobody can have a definite view of that. So in comparison, just to give you a bit of a flavor of differences, on Montenegro, very clear deadline and very clear, tangible, deliverable in terms of the aspiration process uh, and movement on that. Uh, and even on Bosnia-Herzegovina, and I'm not criticizing, obviously, Bosnia-Herzegovina, but then Alliance has some criticism about what Bosnia-Herzegovina has done in terms of actual reforms that were required from, from that country. I'm, I'm finishing in one minute. But, uh, but then ultimately, I'm really speaking quick, but then it's so. <laughs> but uh, even on Bosnia-Herzegovina, Alliance states that there will be active review of the progress for the membership so that as soon as possible, Alliance could start uh, to the, the decision-making process on how to open up the map, basically, as the first stages of the, of, of the map for Bosnia-Herzegovina. So Georgia is, again, somewhere not anywhere there. And very final view on conflicts. We've been very concerned in Georgia in paragraph 31. James Apaturai has made a, um, a statement clarifying that paragraph because what it states is that uh, the citizens of the region of South Caucasus and Moldova, because of the protracted conflicts are impeded in, in realizing fully the potential of becoming members of uh, Euro-Atlantic community. It could be interpreted in different ways. One could say that unless the conflicts are solved, you're not going to become the full member of the Euro-Atlantic community. His statement was that it was referred to citizens rather than countries, so there was no meaning that the conflicts are impediment per se, because every other decision of NATO always stated that the conflicts are not technically the impediments to that. We're worried about that statement, and our aspiration would be that 
perhaps at further occasions in political decision-making processes in NATO, there could be either clearer clarification that it's not what it could like with the negative interpretation of that, or it's just taken off again with the next summit when it will be held in Poland so that there's no ambiguity in a very dangerous term related to that. And I hope that we'll have more chance to speak about, yeah, some Georgia-related stuff in the Q&A session. Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Thank you. Thank you for forceful remarks. Uh, I'm not so sure if I should risk you ask a question, uh, but I will still I will, I will risk doing it, um, and I will kindly ask you also to have a short response, uh, if you if you may. Uh, we are of course we are always uh, underline of a partnership between both the countries, Georgia, not only between both the countries and Georgia, Ukraine as well, Moldova, etc. Um, there are some paradoxes, because look, in 2008, Russian Georgian war, actually we receive contingency planning. 2014, the basically Russia's aggression in Ukraine, we receive a readiness action plan. Actually, you, from 2008, the more there is conflict in post-Soviet space, the more you move away from the NATO. Is it correct? Actually, the political conditions are not so favorable for, for membership of Georgia or some other countries, which has been, and we've been benefiting I think from that, that. There are, there's this two-track, actually. Uh, I don't view the process of uh, getting closer to NATO being stalled for Georgia because we've made a remarkable progress when we speak about uh, getting closer to the standards of, of membership. So it's not a lost time, definitely. But in terms of the political uh, climate or political decision-making processes, to me the main problem is that how much inner looking the alliance could become, and the same goes with the EU, so that without saying so, we might end up, some of us, in, on the other side of the dividing lines in Europe, and God knows how long. And that's a very scary perspective for us, obviously. So for the alliance to have a strategic understanding how it can secure the security of it, it needs to look larger than what the membership, current members is, and that's the best answer to that. And very small thing on Bucharest, I guess that Bucharest, the main problem was not the fact that it has been decided that Georgia will be member of the alliance, but an apparent, a very apparent lack of consensus of actually uh, readiness of embracing Georgia as part of the common security, the taking responsibility on that. And that has been an invitation basically to Russia for the war rather than a deterring factor in that sense. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Leonid, Leonid Polyakov, Senior Fellow of Institute for Strategic studies, new Ukraine. The only the same question uh, what I ask Eka about um, are you satisfied with practical, political, diplomatic support in the NATO summit and you might of course speak more generally because I understand that now there are some bilateral assistance from a number of countries or the willingness uh, to engage more on bilateral level as well. How you see the NATO summit, the NATO response, Western response to what's going on in Ukraine and, uh, and its support. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before talking about NATO staff, uh, I would uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, Latvian people, Latvian government, and uh, neighboring countries, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, as well as Sweden, US, Britain, and few other countries which were continuously and firmly supporting Ukraine in its fight against uh, Russian mercenaries and now no Russian regular troops. Thank you very much. Uh, we really value uh, friends in need. Uh, as far as the uh, NATO summit is concerned, um, I would try to be both diplomatic and frank with you. Uh, let's see how it works. Uh, better later than never. Well, of course, and I congratulate you. Uh, you received uh, yet another uh, higher assurance uh, from uh, NATO as collective defense and collective security organization. However, <coughs> uh, if I, uh, it is di it's diplomatic, uh, uh, and it, when it comes to be frank, it's too late and too military. Uh, despite uh, my mostly uh, military background of being uh, uh, 
retired colonel of Ukraine uh, Army and uh, twice Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine. Uh, I would talk not uh, about the military aspects of the war and current crisis in Ukraine, but rather about other related security things, so, uh, because uh, when guns start shooting, it's a bit too late uh, to preclude a war. If you want to deter the aggressor, if you want to preclude a real shooting by guns and using a future bases on your territory for the real purposes against aggressor, I would invite you to uh, study both Ukrainian and universal lessons of uh, how wars start. And here, what we learned in a hard way, and if it comes to NATO, that without the U.S. leadership, not, NATO is mostly a paper tiger. Uh, many countries were waiting and uh, watching how the U.S. will react on the occupation of Crimea and on other aggressive uh, moves from Russia. And only after a few months when uh, Ukraine started receiving not only MREs, uh, meals ready to eat from Americans, but a little bit more substantive support, countries like uh, Poland, France uh, provided some practical support and uh, some other countries promised to provide this support. Uh, we are still waiting for practical support other than political and sanctions. However, sanctions are also very important because economic dependence from your future aggressor really plays a, a significant role. As uh, countries which I did not name uh, has appeared surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly to, to us uh, valuing their um, economic contracts and revenues from investments and trade with Russia much higher than common uh, European values. So our appeals to some EU members uh, went in vain and then they continued to support uh, their uh, economic interests rather than support uh, Ukraine defending uh, values on Maidan and on, uh, in, on Donbass. Um, and even when the war starts, certain military operations take into account when targeting the places on the territory of the enemy, where, uh, w whether or not the investments were present in certain factories, even defensive ones or not. Uh, during the World War II, uh, some military experts claimed that uh, uh, Allied aviation did not bomb uh, German factories where uh, pre-war investments were placed. Energy dependence, the same. Many countries put their energy interests uh, in front of uh, the common values and common even security interests. And it was uh, clear uh, for certain Central and South European countries especially. Um, to turn it a little bit different way, uh, when you see uh, certain countries which are on the way of continuous military build-up, which in the future can threaten your countries. And at the same time, you trade with this country and pay money for gas, for oil, for other things. Where those money will go? Those money will go to guns, to subversive activity, to spies, uh, to undermining your uh, population morale in the future war. And it works point blank, like it worked in Ukraine, it worked in Georgia, and still works in European countries and North America, North America including Latvia. We'll talk about it this a little bit later. 
The next uh, non-military factor, political corruption. It's not a big secret that Russia invests a lot in corrupting political parties, politicians, bureaucrats, uh, journalists, academicians to uh, come up with uh, favorable to Russia statements, uh, moves, projects, uh, obs observations, so on. In Crimea, uh, during this fake referendum of uh, March 16, who were those foreign observers? Do you know? They were coming from Hungary, from Jobbik party. They were coming from Austria. They were coming from some other countries representing radical movements. And uh, watching uh, uh, Western media for Western audience, it was not immediately clear whether this quote-unquote balanced information from foreign participants is true or not. But I'm telling you, it was certainly not true. And the last but not least, information affair. Uh, Russian TV today, major channels are not uh, actually the media. They are propaganda machine. In Ukraine, uh, we canceled uh, the transmission. But here in Latvia, uh, in the hotel, it's easy to see them. And uh, they use a very simple uh, propaganda trick. And for unprepared audience, it is impossible uh, to uh, differentiate bet be between the lie and truth. They put, let's say, 90% of reports from Syria, from Iraq, from, other play uh, from Gaza Strip, which are seemingly true. And then 10% coming from Ukraine, which is the most sensitive for Russia, is a total lie. And uh, audience here... <laughs> looking just for these few channels will, be not, will not be able. And then it will be again too late, too little, or too military. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Leonid. Um, in this case, I have immediate question uh, because you said that uh, NATO basically is a paper tiger and, of course, without U.S. leadership. So does Ukraine... Can, can Ukraine rely on the West in this case or on NATO? It should be basically what's a major assessment, conclusion in Ukraine is that Ukraine can rely just on itself. Or still you would see some ways of cooperating, some ways of assistance, what you are looking for. There have been sanctions from European Union side. You want me but to answer diplomatically or frankly? Frankly, frankly. <laughs> I think okay. it's much more interesting. Frankly, please. Okay. Uh, just disclaimer, uh, I am former official, uh, I do not represent the opinion of the government or the parliament where I consult from time to time and uh, other, any other governmental organization. Uh, well, at the beginning there was some hope uh, because we have a charter on distinctive partnership uh, which states that uh, Ukraine can ask NATO when it feels threatened to start uh, consultative um, mechanism in order for NATO to support or to provide possible support to Ukraine. It didn't start. And uh, for months after months after Russia invaded Crimea, NATO from Brussels was sending uh, assessment mission after assessment mission and nothing practical. I personally, after retire, retiring for political, let's say, reasons uh, from uh, the ministry, because we are changing the mini uh, ministers <laughs> quickly these days. Uh, it's already the third minister, or this year it's the fourth minister, basically, of defense. Uh, I came to the States begging uh, for support uh, as simple as body armor, uh, communication equipment, non-lethal weapons, of course, because uh, U.S. government was also too, uh, too, uh, too slow to figure out 
uh, how, what policies uh, should they uh, choose. And uh, it started coming only recently when Ukraine itself suffering much higher losses than we uh, otherwise could have suffered, uh, started pushing pro-Russian mercenaries and uh, local rebels towards Russian border. So Russian artillery started shelling us massively from behind the border. And uh, from the middle of August, we actually were fighting regular Russian troops, uh, captured a lot of uh, Russian soldiers and officers. And uh, only uh, when in Russia itself it became clear that Russia is actually fighting war in Ukraine and hundreds of Russian young men are dying in Ukraine. Uh, it forced Russian side to, to start negotiation because the first uh, ceasefire our president announced as back as at the end of June. But rebels were so enthusiastic, they refused to cooperate. Now, after actually thousands of dead, about 3,000 in Ukraine, about the same number in Russia, uh, we started a truce. It could have become uh, possible much earlier than that, and these thousands of dead is the price of the West being too slow. Thank you. Uh, thank you to, to, to Leonid. And I think with this we can also quite integrally proceed to Sergei. Sergei Znobyshev, who is director of the Institute for Strategic Assessments in Russia. Uh, Sergei, it's a pleasure to have you. And we are really happy to have the Russian representative because I think it is very important to, to have the full board of uh, participants, stakeholders in this, because at the very end it's about security and stability on the European continent. Uh, but Medvedev today announced that also as response to sanctions that some asymmetric responses should be, should be given from Russian side and basically it undermines the whole European security architecture, security system. Are we in the new Cold War? Would you see that this is really a conflict which might escalate? What is the Russia's perspective on this? Sergey, please, the floor is yours. Um, well, of course, of course we are not. But to, to, uh, to proceed with my answer, I would like to know, you are promising 13 minutes, but you are nervous, as I see, on 8, on, uh, eight minutes already. Yes? <laughs> so I, I, I ask for at least 10 minutes for my, for my answer. Um, I, I, will, I, I will not follow the advice of your Minister of Foreign Affairs. I will not criticize uh, his speech. I will not criticize what he has uh, spoken. Um, I, I don't criticize the ministers at all. But I criticize the policy, and I am very critical to the present policy, what we, we have. I, um, I don't count my thoughts at the same time, and I don't know how many thoughts I will express. But I, will, I, I, do, I do agree with, uh, with my neighbor, and I, I still hope that we, uh, we were and we will be uh, good neighbors. My, my origins, as origins of many Russian people, uh, comes from, from Ukraine, from this part of, of the European globe. Um, so that the, the response of NATO was too late and too military, but perhaps in, in, some, other, in some other sense. I would like to, uh, to draw your attention to the to the thing which is not popular or is completely unpopular in, in European political dialogue. This is the, uh, the, the short history, the 20-year the history of Russian-NATO behavior, of Russian-NATO uh, relations. And uh, I was uh, witnessing these relations, I participated in many acts of it. And um, uh, why I'm doing it and uh, why I call for this, for um, the, the present deep crisis, the deepest crisis in Russian-Western relations after, after um, the, the Cuban crisis, perhaps, 
um, uh, the, this crisis happened to a great extent due to the unbalanced of relations between, between Moscow and Brussels. I, I am hinting at the position of Russian elite, though I don't know what elite is um, in present Russia, uh, but um, uh, as many of them call themselves, and I am, by the way, very, very often opposing uh, them on the, on the TV. We had such a genre as uh, political talk shows, and I'm always, I don't know why, I'm always on the side to which they point the finger saying, you are the fifth column, the fifth column. You are deceiving our country. You are contrary to our interests. But I don't think that our interests lie in some kind of um, stimulating the, the um, armed forces activity, um, wherever it may be. Uh, so, uh, but uh, returning to Russian-NATO relations and uh, the continuation of this, we, uh, we have seen in this latest Wales um, summit in Wales, this is the deep, deep disagreement on the principle and inability to agree, I would say, on the principle, uh, on the, on the on founding on the, on the principal uh, thesis of, of, of our cooperation or partnership. All this partnership, as it was called in the um, founding act, as it was called in the Rome, Rome agreement, uh, this, all, this was left um, almost all, all, all of the points that were agreed upon. Uh, this was left um, declarative. But the essence, the policy of NATO enlargement, and here, I suppose our opinions will differ. I mean our elite, elite and the Latvian elite, yes? Um, so uh, uh, our, our decision makers for 20 years, it, it is already 20 years of the NATO enlargement policy, they were against it. And this, this is the, the complete misunderstanding for, uh, for me personally. I did never consider uh, NATO to be a military, a military threat to, to Russia. But uh, still seeing the situation as it was, I consider that it was a challenge to Russian policy. The whole enlargement um, NATO, uh, the NATO policy, it was a challenge to the NATO concerns uh, not taken into consideration this concerns. And actually, we were hearing um, two or three, um, mostly the same, the same, um, um, the same wording from, from, from Brussels, that enlargement of NATO, which was considered a military political bloc all the time in Moscow, enlargement of NATO is enlargement in, of democracy. It is not threatening your, 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 your interests. And um, anyone who will knock at our door uh, will be able to, sooner or later to join, on join NATO. And very, very peculiar, just recently, just these days, I, um, I've seen the latest Senator Nan commentary who said that um, he uh, strongly disagree with often repeated notion that any nation has a right to join NATO. NATO must make it its own decision on who joins the alliance and should be based on the security alliance and so on and so forth. So it, was, it should be a decision of, of NATO, not as a response that was always given to, to the Moscow representatives that, uh, uh, well, we can do nothing with this. Who comes? We, 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 we take this country into the alliance. And this, was, uh, uh, and this became a watershed a watershed in our, in, a, in our relations, for the Moscow was constantly uh, seeing the approaching of, uh, of NATO, considered to be a military a political bloc, to, to its borders. And um, you remember that uh, the um, Baltic state joining NATO was, came, came very smoothly, and there was very mild reaction from, from the Kremlin, but here, um, on the Ukrainian case, it just um, like the whole. It seemed like the whole mechanism of uh, European relations appeared to be broken. 
And this was, um, this, this came, uh, this appeared not, not um, just from, uh, from, from nothing, for I uh, would um, uh, uh, draw your attention to the, uh, to the uh, speech of Putin in Munich conference in 2007, uh, where all these things were said, that don't, don't press us, don't um, push us to the, to the, to the angle. Um, we, um, we, we do not consider the NATO enlargement to be a fair policy. From the very beginning, we considered that we, we, the Moscow field itself um, deceived for uh, Gorbachev, and I know this by sure, and I spoke several times with Gorbachev and the, his surrounding. He was giving um, oral promises that NATO would not enlarge. All these things, you know, it, it is all perceptional, but out of perception comes out um, big policy and very, very, very negative things um, that, are, that are happening now. Um, and um, still, I would like to say that uh, the present decisions, the uh, answers to perhaps to the, I mean NATO decisions, the answers perhaps to the um, threats um, of, the, of, the, of the present day and threat perception of the present day. But they have very little strategic or long term, thank you, just six minutes and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but seven minutes. Okay. So, but so okay. Minute. okay. But I will, uh, so, I will ask you a question, so we will be still I, able no, to... No, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. Yes, I'm finishing. Yes, I'm finishing. I take my computer and I'm finishing. So, uh, um, the, um, the, the, for the long-term decisions upon the European security may be made only with the participation of Russia, and um, this is not only my opinion, this is a, a, a very broad vision of politicians and experts, not only from the Russian, from the Russian lead. Russia is, is a neighbor, and um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, nothing else can be, can, can be invented but uh, the engagement of Russia, um, reconstitution of trust. This will not happen today, this will not happen tomorrow morning. But this is the thing that we should work upon. And um, experts like you and me should do it perhaps in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Fergie. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And it's always a pleasure to have exactly diversity of views and to have also a Russian view. Um, I just recently heard a, a sort of description that what we see now, it's a geopolitics of resentment. Uh, there is some resentment around the world and also on the Russian side there is some resentment about what has happened in the last 20, 25 years. And I think we should, in a sense, take responsibilities that perhaps Russia is resentful. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, why those nations, Baltic countries, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, it seems, we cannot even now exclude Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan, are so much willing to join NATO. Of course, Kazakhstan is a little bit far-fetched, but why? Mongolia. Okay, Mongolia at some moment. But... Uh, is it something also wrong about uh, Russia's or Moscow's policy if all those neighbors of Russia are so much willing to secure its security by the way of becoming the members of the NATO? Mm, don't ask me for an answer. I, I cannot <laughs> answer for Moscow, you see. <laughs> but uh, my, my, my vision of the situation is that uh, the system of European security is working without Russia. It is something, sometimes some Russian opinion is taken into consideration, sometimes not. And the, the European system should be built within Russia, Russia being within the security system. And by the way, one of uh, the recent proposals of such nice person as the previous president Medvedev, yes, the um, European Security Treaty, nobody even paid attention to it. It was a proposal. It was the proposal came out of certain concern. It was some mild way out, and we missed this opportunity. And I would remind you that um, Russia several times, uh, in different, in different, um, um, so to say, edition or different wording, yes, uh, Medvedev, uh, Putin, uh, several times. They were proposing um, for Russia to join NATO, or uh, NATO to start somehow considering not, uh, Russia possibility to, to join NATO. 
but it was omitted. It was omitted. I can give you the dates, the almost closed, uh, the, the wordings, and so on and so forth. I, I, I don't, and now we have the situation. You should have, we should have Russia inside the European, we should have Russia inside the European dialogue. Uh, and neglecting the, the hints, the proposals, the wordings, we are, we, are, we are bringing to the situation that we have now. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So then let's proceed uh, to Doug Wake, who is now visiting fellow of Latvian Institute of International Affairs, but of course you have a long background of diplomatic, uh, diplomatic experiences of being here in Latvian Embassy uh, almost 20 years ago. But, but an additional one is you've been also part of the OSCE. And of course OSCE uh, is an organization which also involves Russia and which has been in a sense multilateral framework envisage to establish some European, pan-European security architecture. Would you see that it has been unsuccessful, uh, this multilateral frameworks, and the country stakeholders involved actually always been in confront confronting position rather than trying to reconcile their, their differences? Please. Thank you, Anderson. Before I answer your OSCE question, um, I need to express my appreciation for your organization of this event and for welcoming me here. Um, as uh, you suggested, I, I do have some experience in this country, uh, uh, spending some time in the mid-90s, uh, um, but even going back further when this country was um, uh, under a, a fairly heavy occupation, uh, and I was visiting from, uh, from Leningrad, where I served uh, at the consulate, uh, watching the, uh, the, the process of uh, restoring independence. Um, and. Um, I'll speak a little bit um, uh, on the basis of that experience as, as well as, uh, as, well as the, uh, the more recent experience in the OSCE, um, not as a representative of either the United States or the OSCE. Um, of course, I only speak for myself. And um, I'll take your question first about the OSCE and then say a little bit, if, if, if time permits, on um, what um, uh, was the original topic of, of the, of the um, debriefing the implications for, for some of the Eurasian partners and, and, and as you'd requested a little bit on, on the role of the United States. As far as the OSCE, I think, um, uh, frankly, if one looks at uh, events as recently as, uh, uh, as um, uh, last Friday, um, the role of the OSCE as uh, an organization and a process that um, does have a useful role in trying to find um, the common ground um, among uh, not just this uh, complicated consensus process of 28 in NATO, but of a consensus process of 57 within, uh, within um, a broader framework and a process that includes Russia, um, has been shown again. I mean, it was the OSCE, after all, that um, was able to bring together uh, these uh, people who essentially, um, even after the agreement was signed, um, insisted they hadn't talked to each other uh, and negotiated with each other because there was a framework uh, found whereby um, the OSCE could um, be part of a, a, um, a trilateral uh, consultative group or, or contact group um, with the Russian Federation that somehow at the bottom of the paper also had the signatures of Mr. Zakharchenko and, uh, and his, his colleague. Um, so that I think um, on that side the OSCE's usefulness has been proven. Um, as far as the OSCE as an embodiment of common values of all of the things that have been agreed in consensus documents from 1975, um, particularly through the early 90s, um, we have to raise a lot more questions now. Um, the common values part, the human rights part, um, is, um, if not in disarray, at least um, seriously threatened by um, frankly, not just the approaches taken by the Russian Federation, but by um, the fact that a whole number of OSCE participating states um, no longer um, seem very serious about implementing those commitments to human rights, free elections, uh, and so on. Um, if I may um, turn back to this issue of what the, the, the NATO summit um, meant for um, the Eurasian partners, um, I'd also uh, draw a little bit on my experience um, uh, just at the end of the time that I was in Latvia in the mid-90s uh, because 
I think when we, when we look at this uh, whale summit as a summit that did not invite um, applicants that um, uh, sought membership in NATO, um, we may want to go back and recall that the first time that happened was Madrid in 1997 when some applicants were admitted and some were not. And the some that were not, of course, were the Baltic states. And there was one approach here in the Baltics that said the door has been slammed in our face. We're not welcome. Even if they say it's an open door, we can't come through. And I think it was very important at that time uh, for um, those of you who were involved in uh, the policy of, of the Baltic states, for those who were um, looking at this from a longer-term perspective uh, in uh, Western countries to say, um, this is a process. Um, the sun will come up the next day after the Madrid summit, and it's time to just go and start working on, on what you need to do to meet the requirements. Um, these were the words that I remember um, my ambassador, who some of you may remember from that time, Larry Knapper, saying to his Latvian counterparts. And it's what I guess um, Montenegrin and Macedonian and Georgian counterparts need to think about now, um, despite the fact, as you've suggested, that 2008 was a long time ago already, and, and for our Georgian colleagues, uh, um, the words may not sound that different, but um, as you've um, uh, as, as we've uh, developed in the course of the session. In fact, um, there was progress. There were uh, steps taken um, in regard to, to uh, Georgian membership. I would, um, on this question of disappointment um, versus hope, um, get back to something that was mentioned um, uh, by Guna at the beginning, which is that um, the, uh, the whale summit did, in fact, suggest that not just in words, the open door is still open, but that there is something very specific going on. And that was what you mentioned about Montenegro. You know, deadlines, decisions to be made, um, actions to be taken by the, by the applicant, which if taken uh, are likely to be considered favorably. And I think uh, although it's a long way from, uh, from, from Georgian and ultimately if uh, Ukraine applies uh, Ukrainian, um, membership in NATO, the fact that this process is continuing um, with, with even a small country far from, from uh, the fight right now um, is important. Um, I know that the time is, is limited and therefore um, I'll turn um, to um, what you mentioned um, uh, about, well, well, what you asked me to, to comment on, which is the role of the United States in this broader region. And I'm very fortunate that as I take my last minute, I turn to Bob Norick, who um, is probably more of an expert, particularly when we get to the, the practical military implications. But what I would say, um, again, drawing on, on uh, some of the experience that I've seen in, in uh, the diplomatic world, is that the very fact that Barack Obama was in Tallinn um, uh, on the day before this NATO summit and the fact that Barack Obama used words that he has only used in a negative context in other, uh, in, in other recent speeches, that was boots on the ground, um, suggests that for the Baltic states um, and the broader region, um, the United States' um, attention has been grabbed by what's happened in Ukraine and uh, the United States' focus on NATO is now very much back on NATO's core function of defending um, the, the, the allies, um, not diminishing that there are many other security challenges in the world, but um, the fact that that was the one that was focused on the day before the NATO summit, and in such strong words, I think is uh, something that one can draw a certain amount of reassurance mm -hmm. from. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Doug. Um, so from this multifaceted, you can say, perspective, including the uh, United States uh, having the historical perspective as well and having the OSCE um, perspective as well. Bob, uh, Bob Nurik, a senior fellow at Atlantic Council and as well a visiting senior fellow at Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Um, well, it's of course, we know the affiliation and uh, it gives me the chance also to ask, 
you can say on European perspective, of course, in combination with U.S. perspective and on a Finnish and Swedish perspective, uh, actually, I might even ask. So, as Doc mentioned, so we, we, we have strengthened those core functions of NATO, but it seems that Finland is not so much uh, rushing into this core core NATO or NATO which has strengthened its core functions and why then basically other countries in eastern eastern neighborhood should think even about it. Perhaps it's it's good what the Finnish model is in this regard. Please, uh, Bob, what's your what's your take on this? Uh, well, th thank you, Andres, for inviting me. It's very good to be back. I'm, I will talk a bit about what I think I'm seeing at the moment in Sweden and Finland, but I'm going to try to embed that in the broader question that was put to me, which is what what does the Wales Summit um, portend? Um, what does it imply for U.S. engagement in security in the region more generally, um, both in the Nordic Baltic region and a bit with respect to, to Russia? Um, so let me say a bit about that. I'll, I'm gonna, it'll be a sort of a headline form, um, I think, because of the timing, uh, but happy to try to elaborate later. Um, let me begin by, by going back to the summit for a minute. Um, the, Ukraine, the events in Ukraine um, essentially confronted NATO with two big challenges. One of a very, at least def where defense planning is concerned, one was of a familiar kind and one wasn't. The familiar kind was to again um, bring back the, the problem of um, planning against the possibility of a conventional military attack. I mean, people got worried, for understandable reasons, got worried about that, and particularly in this part of the world. Um, uh, it's not that people thought this was likely. Ukraine is not, uh, Ukraine is not in NATO, but it was, gets harder and harder simply to say, well, you know, nothing could happen. Um, and uh, for all the obvious reasons, collective defense, uh, everybody agreed, is it needed attention. It was back. Um, people saw more capable Russian forces, more mobile, more deployable. Um, and as I say, there was an evident need for uh, the focus on collective defense um, and its credibility. Uh, other speakers have talked about the main steps that, that came out of the, the out of the Wales summit um, to address this. I'll just mention uh, three and talk a little bit about what I think they uh, imply for, for U.S. interests and U.S. engagement. The first of them had to do with the nature of force presence in the region. Um, as others have said, um, there was not agreement on permanent forces, um, uh, permanent boots on the ground, as some people wanted. Uh, and there was some debate early about this and divisions, I think it's fair to say, in the policy community in uh, Washington about how far to go um, for a variety of reasons, including but not only because of um, the, the, the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Um, what I think what very quickly was decided, and at least as a matter of U.S. government policy, was that um, if, if they weren't going to be permanent, if they didn't at the moment need to be permanent, what was important was that they be substantial, that they be visible, that they be sustainable, which is key, and that they be NATO. And by that I mean that not just the U.S. was ready to do it, it was very important from the U.S. point of view that other NATO countries participate as well. And this was a priority in all the internal uh, politicking inside the alliance um, leading up to the Wales Summit. So I think the U.S. is, is very pleased on that score. Um, the, second, uh, the, the, the second decision that came out of Wales also has been referred to. This is the so-called spearhead force, this rapid reaction force of about roughly 4,000 or so, which has meant um, the target is that it should be deployable in 48 hours. That's quick. Um, it's going to be supported by, as others have said, by um, pre-positioned logistics and, and beefed-up facilities and so on. Um, and organized through a new headquarter command in Poland. I stress that because when thinking about U.S. Um, uh, and more broadly European engagement, that command is very important. Um, why? Two reasons. One, the Germans are there. Um, and for those people who worried about the nature of direct German engagement in, in regional security, that's where it's coming. Second is, and this applies to the U.S., but also to all the other forces that are going to be involved in this, this provides a institutional structure. It's a NATO command. It's an institutional structure to sustain this engagement. These it means there'll be planning, there'll be deadlines, there'll be routines, there, there'll be, in, in, in this sense, in the best sense of the word, a bureaucracy supporting this engagement. Commands like this are not easily established. They're not quickly thrown away either. 
And that's going to provide, again, an institutional structure to sustain um, this engagement. I think it's quite important. Um, the third area has to do with political commitments to increase defense spending. A lot of, of our speakers have spoken about that. The politics exists for the U.S. It's not as if, uh, it's not as if um, small differences in, in, in the level or pace of increases is going to have a huge effect on, on U.S. commitment. But it does help. I mean, there, it's, uh, the U.S. and the U.S. Congress will be looking to uh, uh, to all the allies to make sure that they're doing what they can, that they look that they're serious about it, that they're not just um, the, uh, relying on the U.S., as increasingly had been the case, unfortunately, over the last 10 years, given defense planning, uh, defense spending um, uh, uh, trends. The U.S. share of overall spending inside the alliance was going up in ways that over time I think are unsupportable. So this, it's important that with, in some reasonable way these commitments be, be carried out. That's the, that's the, more, that's the uh, cha kind of challenge of a more familiar type. We thought it, we'd hoped, a lot of people hoped it had gone away, but this is what we, the sort of thing we used to worry about back in the Cold War days. The new challenge, the unfamiliar one, has also been referred to. It's the foreign minister called it hybrid warfare. Others have called it asymmetrical warfare. It's captured by this notion of little green men. Um, and that, these sorts of problems have not been the focus of NATO planning before. This is new. Um, NATO, as a result, everyone understands it hasn't been organized itself to uh, prepare itself to respond, and it has to. It has to adapt. Now, everybody, rec you know, this was recognized very early by defense planners all throughout the alliance as a problem. Um, and I think people have focused now on sort of three issues um, that, that need to be addressed. The first is, unlike the first kind, where you're thinking about more or less conventional um, or traditional military forces, here there's a premium when you're thinking about forces on, high, on highly trained special forces, not, you know, not all mechanized troops with tanks and stuff. Um, there were initiatives here before the summit. They're going to be sustained. Um, uh, uh, these, as I say, these, these were important. Um, but there are two other issues that are quite different, which are less military. Um, second one, which is, uh, which is very sensitive, but need, I need to raise it, has to do with the domestic aspect of this. One thing that's clear about dealing with these, you know, the little green men with hybrid warfare um, is domestic cohesion is critical. Uh, and that has implications both for national policy and NATO policy. For NATO, it means a lot more attention to civil-military interactions because it's not just going to be troops. It's a lot of other things that will have to, be, have to work efficiently to deal with it if that kind of problem arises. For, for, for Latvia and Estonia, the issue, of course, it raises has to do with the integration of the Russophone community. Um, I know it's a very sensitive issue. As an American, the last thing I want to do is come here and lecture about what should be done. Um, but if people are serious about, and, and, and this is, it's also, you know, this is, this is difficult, complicated. So um, I'm not going to say, and, and I don't think the U.S. is going to be looking to coming here and wagging a finger at anybody and saying you ought to do X, Y, and Z. What they will be doing, I think, is looking carefully about whether you're taking this seriously now as a security issue, taking a look and saying, okay, are things going as quickly as we think they have to be going? Are we happy with the direction? If not, what should we be doing? In other words, just taking it, taking it seriously. But this is, it's up to Latvia and Estonia to decide, not the U.S. The good news, of course, is Latvia is not, is not Crimea, Estonia is not Crimea, but that issue will be there. Finally, um, just on, on Finland and Sweden, there, was this, uh, there is this interoperability initiative for partners. Um, uh, people have asked about the membership issue. Um, uh, what I can say from being spending quite a bit of time um, there is that there is a serious security debate going on in those two countries of the sort I haven't seen in a very long time. My own judgment from what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from officials is that membership as such is not on the agenda at the moment probably won't be, at least for a little while, um, given the elections coming up and, and what governments look like. But what is up very much on the agenda is nature of engagement. 
They, this was there before because they very much liked what the kind of engagement and the, um, that they'd had um, through ISAF in Afghanistan, and the issue had been how do we sustain that after 2014. Now it's a bigger issue, and um, they're going to be looking not only to sustain what they had before, but to enhance it. And my own view is the more the better. Um, so that issue is very much there, even if the membership issue uh, is not. Okay, finally, just to very quickly um, summary, what does this mean um, about U.S. engagement with respect to NATO and, uh, and the region? NATO is back, European security is back, collective defense is back. Uh, this does not mean that other issues are going to go away. Um, the U.S. has a lot of other things on its plate, but these issues are going to be very, are in the, high on the agenda and, and will stay there. Um, on, finally, on U.S. and Russia, um, Russia is not going to like what it sees coming out of the summit. It's not going to like what it sees by the U.S. role. It will complain. Um, uh, but relations were very, very difficult in any case. Um, um, uh, I think that uh, there's going to be – I'm stopping right now, last sentence. There's, you know, there's going to be um, uh, uh, at some point – first of all, there's going to be a desire to sustain cooperation in some areas of mutual interest, including a nonproliferation and the like. At some point, there'll be uh, questions about how to reengage. Uh, with Russia and on what, but on the bigger security issues, my own sense is is that this is going to be a very narrow agenda, uh, um, at least as long as Mr. Putin is in power. Thank you, Bob. Um, I think we had an excellent, uh, excellent spectrum of uh, contributions from our distinguished panelists, and we made, in a sense, even a whole. Uh, whole full circle, uh, starting with a uh, tone set by the minister, and you can say on a comprehensive approach, and then we went through the uh, eastern uh, neighborhood and eastern partners, uh, and coming back actually to the region, and coming back to U.S. involvement, and also the Finnish and Swedish perspectives to some extent in this regard as well. Uh, we have roughly, we have roughly half an hour, and of course, uh, since, since this seminar, this debate is devoted to way forward with NATO e Eurasian partnerships, Eurasian security, uh, of course, I would still encourage people who would comment or ask uh, exactly address uh, those particular issues. And since we have those roughly, we have roughly half an hour, I would say two rounds of comments and questions. Uh, so, and please introduce yourself, and also it would be nice to address some particular person with some particular uh, question. Please. Thank you very much. At the same time, Sergei made a very important point in that Russia feels that Russia has been excluded from the security architecture of uh, Europe and uh, Eurasia in the way that it's developing. And it is also clear from a number of other commentators that the outcome of the decisions made at Wales, this will take time to implement. They will reassure countries like Latvia, but at the same time, it is inevitable that they will make Russia feel even more threatened if that's the way Russia is feeling. Uh, equally, a number of commentators have indicated that uh, uh, President Putin is becoming increasingly isolated, and in fact, I think Sergei hinted at something like that, and is employing a, uh, an ever-decreasing number of of advisers um, on policy, maybe advisers who do not particularly wish to uh, confront him with bad news and would rather agree with the point of view that he has. He has also, and he is not the first, um, in recent times, even last week, mentioned the use of nuclear weapons, and that is not by accident. And uh, the Russian Federation has, last week, uh, gone through a very serious, uh, one of the biggest exercises of nuclear readiness that we've seen in many years. If you put all those things together with the um, understandable or not paranoia in Moscow, with an increase of NATO militarism next to Moscow, with a feeling that uh, things are only going to get worse, 
that um, there is a window of opportunity while the current U.S. president is thought, perhaps in Moscow, to be weak and uh, unable to follow through on red lines, as has happened last year uh, with regard to Syria. Uh, The question is, is it possible that the Kremlin might think that if there is ever going to be a chance to break NATO, then now is the time to challenge NATO, Article 5, and if necessary, de-escalate with a tactical nuclear strike somewhere in Europe. And initially, I would put that question to Sergei. I, I cannot answer this question. <laughs> this, it is, it is nuclear planning, yes? Let's take the, some couple of questions and then we come back, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, please. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alexander Solevich, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, an entrepreneur, small. And I'd like, I, I have offer. I'd like to show everybody this picture. No, no offers, please. Uh, no, oh, uh, comments, comments. Comments? Please, please shortly. Yes. Yeah, uh, shortly. Uh, this, this, uh, this building, he is, he is two flags. Uh, what when Riga, Riga flag is working now, Riga is actively 23 years, very good work. And all wo- worldwide knows this, our flag. Another flag is... What uh, is the question or comment which is uh, uh, addressed to the, to, okay. the, to the speakers? And here in Riga flag has animals. Everybody okay. knows what is animals uh, face. I'd like to I'd like know your face. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Please. There you go. Hello? Vegas <laughs> Poli, it's uh, Latvian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, also associate of the Institute of Andres Leading. Um, actually, I have a question to Sergey. Uh, it will not be as long as Mr. Kajovacinj, but uh, you were mentioning that you've been stigmatized as the fifth column, however, being working in both in academia and, and here in uh, the state government. I am pretty much convinced that both Eka, Andres, and uh, Bob as well, uh, because of their work, there is a possibility to influence actually the policymakers. So therefore, my qu- I have actually two questions. What do you think, Sergey? what could happen, what should Russians do in order to have really sensible policy proposals for the Kremlin leadership? So what could Russians do to help to have to come to senses, to say, to say, to talk, to understand each other. And the second question is, is there any way we in the West could help in order to, to make this uh, dialogue to go forward? Is it a way to help a media environment to make it more plural and so on? So these are two questions. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please, Igor. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Igor Vatolin, journalist, Latvian, Russian. Uh, I have a question. What do you think about the perspective that Mr. Putin, while in the USA there is President Peacemaker Barack Obama till November uh, 2016, would try to just to, um, to see whether NATO is able to answer something and to use this Palestinian-Ukrainian scenario with uh, w- not using regular military force. For example, here in Latvia, with a rather big amount of Russian speakers who to some extent are watching Russian TV and can support this initiative. What do you think about this perspective? Okay, thank you. So I think we can come back to other speakers. Uh, Sergey, I think the majority of questions or some of the questions were... 
Thank you. Too, too much for me. This is, this is a speak so those many minutes, so you yes. see that we are very hospitable in this okay. regard. Please. Starting from, from, the, from, the, from the nuclear scenario. If I had authority to answer, if I would be an authoritative person, say, like if I would be, say, Deputy Minister of Defense, I would answer to you definitely not. Never any nuclear scenario will happen. And um, my assessment is, my personal assessment is, that uh, Deputy Minister of Defense answering this question would be right. Uh, for um, the, the policy now on the brink of, well, balancing, you know, but um, uh, what, what is, um, there is a strong necessity to start dialogue. And I, I suppose that there is a readiness for such dialogue. At least I see it in Moscow. And um, um, by the way, that the, uh, the um, events, uh, the very grave events in Ukraine and um, all that is going on there is, is curtailing. And um, uh, th there is readiness for, for dialogue on, on all parts. Uh, but, but by the way, I, I don't see, I, do, I see readiness for dialogue in NATO, uh, in the European participants to NATO. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the principal peacemaker, I mean President Obama, is not ready at all, as I see it, and he is... Uh, from, from one speech to another, he is using more and more strong wording. I don't understand why, and this, when I was speaking with the officials in Moscow, this brings a very, very deep disarray and, uh, um, in, in the perspectives of the day-to-day -day relations with the United States of America. But the, the dialogue with, with NATO, I, I suppose it should be, it should be started, and uh, it, and I strongly think that uh, the, 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 the experts, uh, the, the authoritative experts like you are, Andres, yes, they now make do a lot to give advice, to, give, to, to start um, creating the schemes of the future European security. And the same, I would um, answer to uh, the um, second question, what, what may be the help? The help is start bringing these schemes, making these schemes public, and these uh, schemes were already um, produced during the much more uh, grave confrontation which we had in Soviet times. Um, at the beginning of Gorbachev era, there was a very strong expert dialogue between uh, Soviet at that time and American uh, scientists, which was very fruitful and which uh, did, did a lot. I suppose it is time for such, for such dialogue. And, um, the, and, and, and the, this is, by the way, the answer to a certain extent to the third question. But it is very peculiar that we are afraid, I mean, um, in Russia people are afraid, uh, the politicians are afraid of Orange Revolution being exported from the United States, being, being done by the United States, yes? And uh, they consider, many of them consider that the Ukrainian scenario was exported from the United States. My, 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 my vision is, and, and my assurance is that it was done by people, the people who were tremendously discontent with the way of living and the, the, the perspectives uh, of their cooperation, uh, so to say, with the, with the authorities. Um, and, um, um, and, and many in our country uh, suppose that these scenarios were um, uh, executed in, uh, in other parts of the globe, whether it is right or, or no, but um, I am quite sure that the peoples, the peoples of uh, Soviet Union in, in the time of, uh, um, of the perestroika and peoples of Ukraine, um, they have the right for their, their own, own choice. It is quite obvious to me. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. If you want yes, please. Words, uh, well, with experience we already have confronting Russian policies, it looks like uh, 
going on and on these Mamma Mia scenarios. Mamma Mia, what Russia will say when Poland and Hungary become NATO members. Mamma Mia, what uh, Russians will say when Baltics become NATO members. Mamma Mia, Ukraine will go to NATO, uh, will go to nowhere. Unless, uh, well, there, are, there is a dialogue not only between the experts, but between psychiatrists uh, uh, supporting to uh, leadership of certain big countries uh, how to understand certain policies. Uh, my suggestion, uh, given the Ukrainian experience, that there is the only way to uh, stick to rules rather than uh, unpredictable concerns. Of course, there is a place for psychiatrists, but uh, rules should be uh, uh, maybe more simple, but strong, stronger observed. And uh, the problem is that uh, when a certain country uh, in the international community disregards, completely disregards its obligations, rules, and so on, the rest of the community uh, so far has no answer. Uh, we should uh, think as, as a mankind, not only about how at this time uh, Russian current leadership will react. Because uh, for me, uh, Russian-born Ukrainian, if you will, um, it is clear that uh, current Russian leadership first will never be satisfied. It will, when getting more, it will always have uh, a desire to get more and more and more. And the second, that uh, Russian people and Moscow are rather significantly different entities. And uh, we should uh, speak and rely not only for, to people living in luxury apartments in Moscow and around, but to the rest of Russia. And I see the only way is to speak not to Moscow, but to, to Russia. Thank you. Very, very few comments. Um, again, it's very hard, obviously, to look into the mind of Putin maybe fully and then to say what he's up to. But then one could make some conclusions based on the very empirical historic experience in recent years that we have. And then, to be fair, I mean, he, I mean if we look on how Russia acts, there's always timely, fairly warning that is given to what could be expected, actually. It's just nobody either pays attention to it or is not ready to realize that those warnings are real, actually, and then to realize that it's not uh, just a fantasy or bluffing, but it's an actual thinking, and then there's an actual readiness in terms of building up capabilities to act upon it. And then it's not... Uh, right at hand, blast out of an action, but then it's a gradual way of implementing a very meticulous planning, which by the way Russia has shown to be very capable in terms of changing tactical ways of implementing that. And again, being in Georgia, and I guess I, uh, I, I uh, have to refer, and I believe that it's a valid referral to the war in 2008, how quick business as usual has been back to Russia has been a testing ground for Russia at that time. And then even at that time, we've been saying that the next will be Ukraine. Not that we have any satisfaction to see that what happens obviously in Ukraine, because the way we see what happens in Ukraine is an integral fight for our own freedom, obviously. But that's, that's how the dynamics grow. And Ukraine, based on what will happen in Ukraine, we can see what will follow, because there will be action that will follow. Because so far, to be frank, what I see in terms of reaction to the war in Ukraine Russia is not thinking that it is deterred right now because the very essential components that could actually deter Russian action, which are the lethal weapons and the military assistance that would have been needed to Ukraine. I'm not even speaking about other early preventative measures because that would be a too long discussion that we could enter right now because there the were possibilities of avoiding that. But then even at this point of confrontation, I mean, it's not happening. And we see even after the summit in Wales that there have been now multiple statements by many states saying that bilaterally they don't play to provide lethal weapons to Ukraine. So if anybody paid attention to what has been put in statements about Kazakhstan, very interesting to me in a very negative way. If one looks into that, it sort of shows to me that he pays tribute to Nazarbayev, so until he's there, 
he might not really mess it up quickly, but then he might have some plans how quickly he might not be there. And then North Kazakhstan is part of an equation. Moldova is obviously there as ready at hand sort of place to manipulate with, and then we know that elections are upcoming. We know what are the public sentiments, what are the difficulties of the coalition government over there for a small nation who is really struggling to find its place as the part of a European sort of family. And then, I mean, Georgia. I mean, Georgia is not on the quiet list right now. I mean, in Georgia, Russia has 10,000 troops permanently in the occupied regions advanced military bases. In Abkhazian region, he just made it up artificial coup d'etat so that the new guy, who, which is even more sort of fully controlled by Russia, is a KGB general, there are already moves and steps they are announcing that could lead to very bad developments in the region of Abkhazia. And then in that respect, uh, NATO summit declaration saying that security of the Black Sea in the long run could be strategically affected. To me, it's very short-sighted because the security of the Black Sea is already very much affected affected by the occupation of Abkhazian region and even more so by the annexation of Crimea. And to conclude so that I'm not very long, when we speak about Russia being part of the common security architecture in Europe, nobody would, 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 would object to that. Is Russia to reverse its decision on annexation of Crimea or withdraw from Georgia and then the occupy uh, territories of Georgia? Because it's not just theoretical construct that I want to be part of the good neighborly relations and then common security architecture. Because if we agree on the principle that common architecture means that it is based on common values, which is that we have to respect sovereignty and territorial integrity and basic rights of each other, Russia just went way beyond all violating all those rules. So now it's the turn of Russia to prove what it's up to. And it's not about to prove anything because Russia says that I don't care, frankly. I'm going forward with implementation of my plan. If you're strong enough, deter me. If not, then I'm going ahead. So that's unfortunately where we find ourselves in. And then it's a very unfortunate place to be in. And to be very frank, I've see very narrow window of opportunity right now in addressing uh, the overall sort of population in Russia as well because if you see what are the rates of the public opinion polls and then support to the policy, how meticulously well this propaganda machine has been built and brainwashed the society, well that's a very scary picture to me right now. I'd rather see countries in the neighborhood and including the Baltics by the way working on internal cohesion and then that's very valid, I guess, for Latvian case as well, to build the resilience, economic uh, resilience, military resilience, and social cohesion so that there's no way of manipulating with this new, and not that much new maybe, uh, hybrid war type of the warfare where deniability is the key component, a quick uh, change of the facts on the ground, and less than that is the uh, complication of the political processes inside and manipulation of the foreign policy stances of those countries within the alliances that they are part of. And we see some of the members of the alliance right now who are playing very strange uh, part right now in terms of decision-making processes. So very smart, very comprehensive action. And we have to be realistic that we are not up to a small challenge right there, which is at another level of becoming transparent. And Russia made it transparent willingly, by the way. It's not that we've identified now commonly that now when we see that it's aggression and the war. Russia made sure that there was no way of not recognizing that, by the way, because it's elevated the high-risk game that it plays, and that's where we are right now. Okay, good. Thank you. Good night. Uh, well, when it comes to scenarios like that and when you're talking about NATO allies, the answer is very short. NATO is ready. And that's that's it. And and all the whales summit the decisions prove that NATO is working to be ready. And and uh, when the time will come, should it come, it will have all the plans and and and, and training and all the rest there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Doug? Maybe just a very brief comment to place myself not exactly between. Um, uh, Eka and Leonid on one hand and Sergei on the other, but Sergei talked about uh, what he said was a willingness in, in Moscow for dialogue, and of course it's easy for most of us to dismiss that uh, given the, the actions on the ground. Um, Eka and Leonid talked about, I think, the, what they saw as the weakness of the Western response to, um, to uh, uh, Russian behavior so far. Um, the one thing I would uh, put out there is that whether the West responded as forcefully as Georgia and Ukraine uh, would have liked to the last two uh, terrible wars, um, Georgians and Ukrainians responded. Um, there, were, uh, there was real resistance on, on the ground um, by Ukrainians to uh, Russian behavior. Um, 
the West did, if not militarily, um, with economic sanctions, do perhaps a lot more than Vladimir Putin had expected. And um, when the response on the ground by Ukrainians forced Russia to intervene directly, um, you started to see uh, more uh, uh, reaction from soldiers, mothers, and, and people within Russia itself. And that doesn't lead me to say, aha, Russia is now ready for dialogue and uh, believes it made a big mistake. But it does raise my questions in my mind whether Russia is about to be as aggressive uh, on uh, uh, the day after tomorrow as it was the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh. Okay. Well, um, two quick comments. Um, first, if I could say a word about this, this uh, question of, of um, nuclear use and um, that, that Giannis raised. Um, is it possible that – is it conceivable that um, – that Putin um, would view this as a time to challenge uh, the credibility of Article 5 and um, de-escalate with tactical nuclear weapons. I have to say, personally, I, I, I find that uh, very, very implausible. I don't dismiss it as a concern, because uh, I hear it here and I hear it in particular in Poland where they worry about this. But I'll, I'll hear the, uh, the reasons why I think it's very, un, uh, very, very unlikely. One is it's important to remember that, you know, what the, doctrine, the, what the doctrinal context for this is. The doctrine talks about using tactical weapons, nuclear weapons to de-escalate in the context of what's clearly a losing conventional war. It's not something they're going to do out of the, sort of out of the blue to see what happens. You'd have to really assume, short, you know, and search, you'd have to assume that they've just gone mad. Uh, in ways that they never have, even in the worst of the Cold War days, to, to, to you know, to sort of assume that that um, this might not start a, a broader nuclear conflagration. Now, the second set of reasons, again, putting aside what may be in the head of any policymaker in Moscow, thinking about what NATO and particularly the U.S. would do, if that were to happen, if there were to be a, 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 a scenario like that where all of – you know, maybe in the context of a conventional war where all of a sudden one or two nu nuclear weapons were exploded in the Baltics and the U.S. in particular did not respond, two things would happen very quickly. The first would be that that's the end of NATO um, and the U.S. would know it. The second thing that would happen is the next day there would be an impeachment resolution in the U.S. Senate. So I don't have any doubts about what the U.S. would do. Um, and, I, uh, again, I think it's very important to, to make sure that, that the elements of, of deterrence and, and Article 5 are credible and robust. Given that, I don't worry about that kind of scenario. The other issue that I'd like uh, very quickly is the issue that first Sergei raised and that, and that Giannis um, also referred to, and this is the question of – Russia's sense of being excluded from decision-making and European security, the European security architecture. <laughs> Going back to the mid-'90s, when the first debate started about NATO enlargement, um, I was in the middle of them at Rand, where a lot of this happened, and there were a lot of arguments. It's a good idea, a bad idea, and so on. The one thing everybody agreed about was what we wanted to avoid, which was we wanted to avoid a Russia that was essentially a revisionist power with respect to the European security arrangements. That's what we've got. Um, and over the long run, I would be the first to say that's not healthy. Um, uh, we've been dealing with this issue since 1991. You can make perfectly reasonable arguments which say we should have done a little bit more back in the 90s when maybe it looked uh, – I think myself – you know, that's, that's very possible. There was an underlying problem then, which was nobody was quite sure what kind of Russia we were trying to integrate. Um, my sense now is that issue, when I referred to re-engagement at some point, that issue is going to come back. Um, and we're going to need to think hard about it. But as I, as I indicated before, um, it's not healthy. I'd like to solve it. Um, but I don't see much political energy, capital, or so on, and so on being, um, being devoted to it in the U.S. Or, or more broadly while Putin's there. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, even though I promised, uh, I promised uh, two rounds of questions and comments, I think we are already out of time, so I would finish here. If you still have some questions, comments, uh, you can informally approach state speakers and uh, at, the, at the cup of coffee to have a already the more productive, uh, productive debate. As from my own side, uh, 
I think I, I must be very short here. I, I have a couple of, I think, a couple of points I, I took out of many interesting points here. I think that what, what, what was mentioned here, the domestic resilience is, is very important, and it's not just about resilience to resist something, but I think quite many problems within uh, all this complex is actually coming from out of the weakness. The weakness pushes countries also forward to act sometimes even assertively and aggressively, so to, to compensate for those weaknesses, and I would even speak here in, with regard to Russia. Second, I think important, uh, an important aspect is uh, to have cohesion, cohesion, uh, cohesion uh, within the alliance, cohesion uh, within the European Union, because at the very end it is also important that we speak with uh, common voice and that there are no any grey zones of perceptions, uh, perceptions, uh, perceptions. And third thing is, last but not least, um, that uh, we should still keep the uh, windows of dialogue open, uh, not to escalate so far that there is, we have entrapped ourselves and there is no way out, and just this escalatory logic takes its own self-fulfilling negative uh, detrimental uh, prophecy to all of us. And we, we can uh, picture, outline different scenarios, but we should also work on this, those uh, unpleasant scenarios are also unlikely, and, and, and we are able to still engage and speak of some common language on some issues. And I think it's also echoed here and on the table. With this, thank you very much to the audience for coming, uh, for the being able to sit through long speeches, long remarks, um, also for different, different perspectives. But I think last but not least, I'm very grateful to NATO and also to all of the speakers here at the table with, who have contributed to this debate and providing, providing their contributions. So and please join me in a round of applause.